Hey everyone, it's Natalie, and I just wanted to jump on to give some context to what today's episode is. It is, in fact, an episode that is from a different podcast. PNW Haunts and Homicides is where hosts Caitlin and Cassie chat about true crime and the paranormal and a bunch of other spooky shit that happens in the Pacific Northwest. It's a great podcast. You know, I love spooky, ooky, wooky stuff, and I can't get enough of Halloween and ghosts and scary movies. So if that's your vibe, the show is perfect for you. Enjoy today's episode. All of their information is in the show notes. Just a small reminder, you can find extra episodes of To All the Men I've Tolerated Before on Patreon while you wait for us to come back from our holiday break. And our Patreon is now offering a new series of content called The Misogyny Meltdown. And voting is opened for the Misogynist of the Year Award. So make sure that you head over to Patreon using the links in our bio to go vote so you get to be part of this year's first Misogynist of the Year Award. I'll see you later. Have a great day and go check out PNW Haunts and Homicides. Caitlin. Hi, creepy people. Hi. This is PNW Haunts and Homicides. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Confirmed. Yeah. Can confirm. Can confirm. This case is definitely going to repay you for Sapporo. Oh, thanks. You're <laughs> so welcome. I've been working on it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like I knew. That I would need to really bring it. You knew I was going to pull something scary out of my ass. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. I think I pulled something scarier out of my ass. (laughs) 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 Um, Unfortunately, I pulled this from somewhere other than my ass. Yeah. I think you'll be not super happy with where I pulled it from. Okay. So. Well, I mean, at least it wasn't out of your ass, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm I'm comfortable with this coming from elsewhere. Okay. <laughs> Do you like the Gilmore Girls? Yes. Do you even know me? Okay. All right. <laughs> I just had to ask you before we before you bash them. Is that what you're trying to say? No, oh. you'll see. You're gonna ruin. Are you gonna ruin? Are you going to ruin Gilmore Girls for me? I don't know. We'll see. Kaylee. I officially found the crime that, according to my notes, could ruin the Gilmore Girls for even the most diehard of fans. I hate you. (laughs) I know. Please don't unsubscribe. I'm obviously angry, too. Uh, 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 uh. (sighs) I... And trust me when I say, the name is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay. Not in terms of the Gilmore Girls, per se, but but, I mean, you'll see. Can we go back to the Titanic references? That that made me more comfortable. I don't think I have any for this one. Well, you just said the tip of the iceberg. Oh, (laughs) yeah. That's... Yeah. <laughs> Iceberg right ahead. <laughs> oh, we are charging forward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go. Hit me. Okay. Fuck me up. Uh, I mean, okay. <laughs> if you haven't heard the news yet, I regret to inform you that a dangerous serial rapist is about to be released in Multnomah County. I don't like it. I didn't think you would. 
Multnomah County is right on the edge of basically the counties where Cassie and I both reside. Yeah. As well as a lot of other people. But, yeah. you know, selfishly, <laughs> it's our, our own self-interest. Is Portland Multnomah County? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was just making sure I was. Yeah, you're like, the, am I? <laughs> Portland is what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the big city. So that kind of informs why, you guys, I'm <laughs> shaking with rage and maybe a little bit of fear, because the truth is, this man is a clear and present danger right in our neck of the woods. And no, I am not kidding. Tis not April. No. No. She don't fuck around. Mm -mm. The only thing that I can say here to lighten the mood is that if it makes anyone feel better, this man spells Richard Gilmore differently. (gasps) Okay. Now, for those of you that aren't fans of the show, Gilmore Girls, because I guess there could be some of you... But also, that didn't immediately tune out, Richard Gilmore is the beloved grandfatherly figure in the classic mother-daughter throwback from this elder millennial's youth. R.A.P. Also, how are things under that rock? (laughs) Is it nice under there, Patrick? (laughs) That's a Spongebob reference. I know. Well... (laughs) Be warned, though, that's almost certainly the last laugh. Okay. Uh, Certainly the last hearty laugh, if you got a hearty laugh out of that. Okay. You better have. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. In all seriousness, we try not to overdo it with, you know, trigger warnings because we think most of you know that true crime can be A rather gnarly genre. Mm -hmm. However, I also know what absorbing this type of content did to me throughout the course of my research. And I think if you feel safe enough to listen to content about sexual assault right now, it's a very important story. But for those of you that might be getting ready to go back to a spooky episode to pass the time instead... I think it's really important for you to be aware that this does pertain to a dangerous criminal that will be rejoining the public in the Portland metro area before the end of the year. Oh, I just got chills. Like, it just got freezing in here. Mm -hmm. It's really funny because that's... I I know this, and it's still giving me the chills, and then you said it, and I was like... That's real, apparently. It is real. So I'm not happy about it. I think it goes without saying. I'm not even sure his mother seems thrilled, in all honesty. I would hope not. Um, I mean, I'm not going to talk bad about people's mothers. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to get into it now, though. Um, Because I think we've done our due diligence and all of the PSAs. So tune in, tune out. You know, that's everybody's decision based on what they feel like they can kind of tackle this week. Yeah, Maybe at least check out the show description so you know who we're talking about. Yeah, I do think just from the aspect of public safety, if nothing else, people just need to know about this so and i'll try to include as many of the links that i think will be um informative without necessarily being quite as triggering okay and the pace bin will have um i think it i think i'm up to about uh just shy of maybe 50 different resources jeez yeah wow she went all out oh i went real wild on all of the resources so okay richard gilmore was born november 8th of 1959 we're about a just a little over a week away from his birthday right now yeah sort of seems like 
his date of birth has been all but redacted from the internet, and I thought that seemed odd since you could probably look up first and last names along with tons of personal information about his victims. Hmm. But not about him? I had to look through several copies of different official public record documents regarding his parole hearings, his trials, before I could find one that didn't redact his birth date. I wonder why. Do they say? Because they really wanted to anger me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's piss off Kayla today. Redact yeah. it. Yeah. Um, there is sort of a brief explanation because as per usual, when it comes to the um, kind of some of the reasoning behind some of those things, when it comes to law enforcement, a lot of times Chris is able to give me a little bit of insight there. I still thought it was stupid, so I didn't include it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was important to me. I really wanted to share it with you guys. It's very important to include his date of birth in this story. I'm glad that you found it. Yeah, so. me too. Um, there will be links to both. I believe I have a copy of a redacted version and an unredacted version of some of the court documents that I found. So, okay. Have fun with that, kids. I'm not reading them. You've done the hard part for me. <laughs> yeah. I, well, <laughs> yeah. Richard Troy. Gilmore's clever criminal alias coined by the media coverage was the jogger rapist. That's unpleasant. Deeply. Okay. Was he the jogger or? He was the jogger. And actually, this is a very important aspect oh. of his MO. Okay. So he wasn't attacking joggers, which is yeah. kind of common. Right. Exa okay. That's okay. exactly what you would think of, right? Yes. I'm so glad that you said that. Yay. Yeah. I passed. The literal next sentence. And I took a huge sigh of relief because all I have to do is not take up jogging, right? Wrong. My next sentence. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I. You cannot make this up. I can read her mind, everybody. It's so much more insidious than that unfortunately oh okay i mean you did kind of warn everybody yeah you see richard i'm guessing was something of an avid jogger at least based on our victim count okay he didn't attack women that were out on their regular jogging route he found victims while he was jogging and they were doing any number of things that don't necessarily lead to a heightened state of awareness or alertness. Mm. Just being a person out in the world. Just people in around. Mm -hmm. Richard, or Dick, as I more often refer to him, is a tough nut to crack. Mm. It's a bit more difficult to find information outside of the latest news related to his parole hearings and his upcoming release. But don't worry, we'll get there. But as is true in most of these cases, he stated that he was abused by his father as a child. Which, if true, it sounds like it was pretty horrific. He has reportedly described being beaten with an electrical cord. Oh, ouch. Yeah. And that's prior to his father eventually abandoning the family. Okay. So if it's true, not a great start in life. No. I didn't come across much that would help me to substantiate those details of his earlier life. Got a few things out there floating in the world, so I may come back with an update. We'll see. Yay. Come on for ya. There's another detail about Richard Gilmore I couldn't initially substantiate as well. Apparently, he wanted to become a cop. Hmm. Weird. Mm -hmm. And as you might have guessed, it was... 
far too salacious a thread to just drop it. So I dug in deep and we're going to come back to that. Okay. The first victim that we'll talk about is referred to as Mallory in the limited source material regarding her assault. Because she never shared her real name and story publicly. Okay. On January 8th of 1979, she was a 22-year-old woman simply going about her evening, cooking dinner in her Multnomah County home. When she saw someone in the apartment hallway, at first glance, she thought it must have been her roommate. Mm. But unfortunately, her evening was about to take a dark turn as the realization that this was not her roommate settled in. The intruder beat her pretty badly before raping her, leaving her with two black eyes and a broken nose from the attack. Jesus. It's funny, that choice of words. She recalled the fact that she recited the Lord's Prayer, angered her assailant. Oh my God. No. I know. I just was like, not that we don't ever say it, but the fact that yeah. Jesus was your. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Still, she was determined to survive because her brother had passed away the previous year from drowning. Oh. This was also why she said she kept the information regarding the assault, even from her mother, who was really struggling emotionally still from his passing. Oh my God. I can't even imagine. Mm hmm. Because, of course, this had to be a multi-layered tragedy. Mm. And you guys, I'm so sorry because I needed to talk about this case and make sure that literally everyone everywhere in the world that listens to us would know that this is happening. But obviously there's more. I spoke to a woman named Danielle Tudor. During the time that I spent chatting with her, I came to know her as an incredibly kind, intelligent, motivated, and compassionate woman. She was attacked on November 11th of 1979. <sighs> she is believed to be the third victim in a series of rapes, many of which happened in the neighborhood area around her home at the time. When she spoke to the police following her assault, Another nearby woman had been attacked already just over a month later on the day after Christmas in 1979. Aww. There was no way that anyone could have known that Gilmore had already made a mistake roughly a year prior that would play a significant role in him eventually losing his freedom. Oh, snap. We don't have a lot of information about a number of details in that specific case, but what we do have is one very important piece of the puzzle, no doubt. In 1978, an unnamed woman was assaulted in the neighborhood where both Danielle and the woman who we're referring to as Mallory lived. It wouldn't be long before it would become apparent that it was likely the start of a series of brutal crimes against the young women in and around the Portland metro area. Okay. It's, uh, it's just so close to home. Yeah. Danielle Tudor, who is now an advocate for victims of sexual assault, as well as for better legislation around those crimes, was just 17 years old when Gilmore attacked her in her Southeast Portland home. 17? She was also the only victim to see Gilmore's face well enough to describe it in any detail. Wow. With her recollections of his appearance, law enforcement was able to have an artist produce a composite sketch that helped lead to his arrest in 1986. That's awesome. That's a lot of responsibility for a 17-year-old, though. Oh, my God. Yeah. <sighs> By that time, Gilmore had sexually assaulted eight other women in the late 1970s and early 1980s. That's what police would later learn. 
When we spoke back in October, she shared a terrifying memory from the days following her attack. Oh. She worked at Fred Meyer through the holidays. Her father worked at Fred Meyer at the time, a fact that likely helped to put both of their minds at ease to some degree in the difficult days immediately after her sexual assault. But the relief quickly faded when none other than Richard Gilmore himself came through her checkout line. No. She described knowing immediately at the sight and the smell of him oh. that he was the man that had attacked her. She felt completely frozen. She knew it was him. She said at the time she tried to act as if she had no idea who he was just to get him out of the store. And I'll reveal some insights that Danielle shared about Richard Gilmore that might paint this encounter with a very dark brush after we go through some additional facts of the case. Okay. That sounds so fucking scary. Yeah. And the smell. Like you don't forget, you know? Yeah. Never. Ugh. This next section focuses on Elisa Warner, who had since moved to Anchorage at the time that her story was told by the Oregonian. She was raped on March 2nd of 1980 in the backyard of her boyfriend's Southeast Portland home. Oh my God. On that night back in 1980, she was a 16 year old Gresham Union high school student. Wow. While at a female friend's house, the two had been listening to music and drinking beer. Pretty typical night for a lot of teenagers. Yeah. That night, she argued with her boyfriend before he stormed off. Around 3 a.m., she walked to his house, hoping to wake him by banging on the bedroom window. Mm. Nothing good happens after midnight, kids. No. <laughs> When she didn't have any luck waking him, she sat in the front yard because as she put it, I thought I better not walk home because I could get raped. Oh my God. That thought was literally in her head. I just. Oh. Luck, fate, or just unfortunate circumstances, whatever it was, was about to fail her a second time that night. As a hand clamped over her mouth, she started to turn and was immediately met with a punch. Mm. The man said, scream and I'll kill you. When she tried to stand, he pushed her down, holding her hands behind her back. And this is where I'm going to just let you guys know it. I'm going to try really hard to give you as many of the facts of the case without going out of our way to be too graphic, but there is going to be a description of sexual assault. Okay. I'll be rubbing my crystal. Mm -hmm. As he began forcing her into the backyard and lifting up her shirt, covering her face with it as he did, she decided it was best not to challenge him. She thought back to a class at school and what she had learned about stranger rape. Because women have to think about these things. And it's clear that so many of these women and girls had very distinct thoughts about what they would or wouldn't do or how something like this would affect them. And it just is so heartbreaking. It's crazy. And then you talk to a man and they're like, they've never had those thoughts. You know, no. I mean, I'm sure some men do, but the majority of them don't have to think about that. Yeah, it's her initial attempts to play along were unsuccessful. She began yelling for help, but no one heard her and no one was coming. That horrific realization settled in as he forcibly removed all of her clothes except her shirt, 
before raping her. She tried to stand after he was finished, but he hit her in the face and kicked her in the stomach. God. Before threatening to cut off one of her breasts as a souvenir. Oh my God. What? Like, like that one guy. Uh, Jerry Brudos, I think. Fucking Jerry. Fucking Jerry. Ugh. He instructed her to count to a hundred and then took off. <sighs> After the attack, she sat crying before gathering herself enough to cover herself up with her T-shirt. Then she began pounding on the window again. It was her boyfriend's mother that finally woke up to find her in that horrific state. Oh. How is anyone sleeping that heavily? Do they have teenage like- boys? I, I mean, yeah. Does he have a sound machine and earplugs in and he's snoring? I don't know. know. Wow. (laughs) I don't know. It's just that kind of blew my mind because she's pounding on the window. Yeah. I hope he wasn't purposefully ignoring her, you know? Not that I'm like accusing him of that. No, but you know, if you get in a fight. Yeah. And you don't realize how something like that could really result in... Obviously, something far more harmful no. than you intended. Even if he was ignoring her, like he couldn't have known. No, so. exactly. The woman brought her inside, providing her with a blanket and some clothes. Though the woman wanted to call the police, Warner refused. Mm. Looking back on that night, she'd said, I was scared. I was outside after curfew. Oh, so she thought she'd get in trouble. Yep. I mean, just classic, you know, the yeah. victim blames themselves far too often. Yeah. Eventually, when the woman returned her to her friend's home, they called the rape crisis hotline. Oh. Police were also notified. And to her dismay, they, of course, told her that she needed to call her mother. Hmm. She remembered that call where she cried to her mother as she explained. Her mother, and I'm going to try to say this delicately, her good-for-nothing piece of shit boyfriend, arrived to pick her up at the hospital. Oh, would you look at that? Guess I wasn't feeling that delicate after all. Is This is the boyfriend that wouldn't wake up? Yep. Okay. Yeah. But we're all about to find out why. Okay, I was just going to ask. Yeah. Nothing up to this point was his fault. Okay. He yelled at her all the way home. What? Elisa said, sure enough, he laid into me, telling me it was all my fault, that I was a tease and had asked for it. Can I find this guy? I'm going to cut his fucking dick off. I don't (laughs) even care. Allegedly. Allegedly. (sighs) Listen, in this instance, there may be a more important dick. At the head of the line. I want to take all the dicks off. <laughs> I mean, well, all the bad ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that makes me so mad. Just like in Mallory's case, a lot of tragedy had been laying at the feet of a struggling young woman. You see, Elisa had lost her father just three years prior when he died by suicide after hanging himself. No. Though I'm sure it wasn't easy, Elisa made it out alive. She finished high school, then went on to marry and have a daughter. At the time of her interview, she was married to her third husband. Even though she still has family in the state of Oregon, she rarely visits because of the attack all those years ago. I don't blame her. Listen, Alaska is beautiful. But I never want something to happen to someone that's so ugly that they flee their home state, regardless of what state it is. And the next best thing is to move to Anchorage and never come back. Yeah. Kind of seems fucked. Well, especially now that he's getting out. Like, fuck. Yeah, she's she's never, never. I mean, she'll never want to come back oh. is my prediction. 
1980 was a busy year for Gilmore, it seems. Ew. Yes. Though it wouldn't be until decades later that two other victims' names and stories would be revealed. There's Colleen Kelly, who was just 13 years old in 1980 when she was assaulted by Gilmore. 13? Mm -hmm. He broke into her Southeast Portland home. He raped her in October of that year on her mother's birthday. Oh, come on. Yeah. She would later become a very strong voice amongst many advocating for victims of sexual assault. So good for her. I love when holy fuck women take their pain and suffering and turn it into good. Yeah. 